Welcome to this week's program of Walk the Walk. On last week's program, we learned that we can live free, and it's as easy as one, two, three. This week's program will be a continuation of that same thought, that same truth. It's a byproduct of a daily audio series that my best friend, Sue Wilhite, and I listen to every day. And when I heard this daily audio presentation, I knew that it deeply touched my heart and that God would give me an expanded teaching for myself and for you. So it's a byproduct of that. The audio message that I heard, you can write this down, was entitled, No Closed Doors. No Closed Doors. And the woman who delivered that message was Jill Grimes from Tucson, Arizona. After I received God's teaching, I emailed my notes that I'm sharing with you today to Miss Grimes, and she was so touched. And I had told her that, again, it was God's message on her heart that really had inspired this message that he put on mine. The message that I deliver today really is a flip-flop of that title. Her title was No Closed Doors. The title that God gave me that I want you to write down is Only Open Doors. Her title was No Closed Doors. I want you to write down Only Open Doors. Only Open Doors. Before we get into the teaching uh, from God, I want you to stop and take a moment and, and count, if you can, the number of doors in your home. Count the number of doors in your home. I really took a moment to do that. And if you've got a big home, you're going to need a lot of fingers and a lot of toes. But count the number of doors that you have in your home. And then think about those doors. Go around and kind of think about each one of them. Are they normally open all the time? Are they normally closed all the time? Again, I went through the same process with our home. Our actual official front door is usually closed all the time because we don't use that as our main entrance. We use a side door to come into our home and our family and our friends know that the side door is the main entrance. So that front door is really closed all the time unless a complete stranger comes to the door and we have to open it. Our bedroom door is normally open, but I close it when I go to bed at night. Tim's still up and watching TV, usually a ball game, Neil, and I usually don't like to hear him um, talking loud, I'll say as the cubs are losing so i close the door and then when he comes to bed he leaves the door open so it's kind of both the spare bedroom that we have across from our bedroom that door is open all the time unless we have a guest in our home and they have shut that door that main door that i told you about well it's open and closed uh, again as needed our bathroom doors same way open and closed as needed as i thought about all the doors in our home i really could not think of one door that was or is open all the time. Can you think of a door in your home that is open all of the time? Probably not. As I thought about that, then God had me think of the doors in the church home that I call home, the church that I serve that really is home to me, Reverend Gurdon. You can think of your church home and the doors there, the doors in that church. And I always say that I want people to feel like the doors of that house of God are always open, even when they're closed. And I make it very clear that it's God's house, filled with God's people. And when new people come through those open doors, we want them to feel the open hearts and the open love that is ready to greet them, the open arms also. At the end of this program, I'll tell you about a young man who entered through our church open doors, and I'll share some of his story because it will tell you that there are always only open doors for God's children. But as I thought about the church that I serve, I was reminded of a picture that is in the fellowship hall. And it's a picture of Jesus. It's a beautiful painting of Jesus. And he's standing at a door and he's knocking. So envision that. I loved that painting of Jesus the first time I saw it, but it became more meaningful to me when an older gentleman in our congregation saw me gazing at it one day and came up alongside me and said, Ramona, do you see that there's no doorknob on the door? And I said, well, I hadn't, but I do now. And he said, that's our God. He said, God is not pushy, and he will never barge his way into someone's heart, but he does knock on the door of a person's heart and prays that that person on the inside will take that doorknob and let Jesus come in. Sheldon, that man, was right. God is not a pushy God, and he never barges his way in. He just wants us to use that doorknob that's on the inside of our hearts to let him in. 
once we do that, whenever you took that step of faith, when Jesus was at your door knocking, and you took that door handle on the inside and asked Jesus to come into your heart, then there were only open doors for you. Only open doors. Reverend Gerda, Romans 8.38 proves this point. Romans 8.38 says, Nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Again, once you let Jesus come in, there is no door that can separate you from his love. I want to read to you the passage of scripture that Jill Grimes, that woman who gave that audio um, lift, she used John 20, and I'm going to read to you that same passage, John 20, starting in 19. That evening, on the first day of the week, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors. So the doors were closed and they were locked because they were very afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, say suddenly, suddenly, let's say it again, suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he held out his hands for them to see, and he showed them his side. They were filled with joy when they saw their Lord, and he spoke to them again and said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you refuse to forgive them, they are unforgiven. Now one of the disciples, Thomas, was not with the others when Jesus came, and they told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas replied, I won't believe it until I see the nail wounds in his hands and I put my finger into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Well, eight days later, my friends, eight days later, the disciples were together again and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. The doors were locked, closed, but suddenly, say suddenly, suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them and he said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger and see my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Thomas, don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Thomas replied by saying, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, you believe, Thomas, because you have seen me, but blessed are those who haven't seen me and believe anyway. Jesus' disciples saw him do many other miraculous signs during, besides the ones recorded in this book. But these are written, John says, these are written so that you so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life. You will have life. My friends, the disciples were meeting behind closed, locked doors because they were very afraid of the Jewish leaders. And it says, suddenly, Suddenly, my friends, I love that word. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Suddenly, he did not enter through that locked, closed door. He didn't have to. Remember, the title to today's teaching is Only Open Doors. The door was locked and closed by all human standards, but there was nothing that could or would, Reverend Gerda, keep Jesus away from his very best friends, his first followers. There was nothing that would keep him from them. And he appeared to them suddenly. And what did he say? Peace be with you. Peace be with you. He then held out his hands and he showed them his side. And then the next words that he uttered, again, it was like, boys, get this. Peace be with you. I've read that passage a zillion times, but as God was putting this passage on my heart, I really stopped. And I got further clarity on why he said that twice. Those disciples were really afraid. 
they were really afraid. There was so much tension and unrest and unease in that atmosphere, and they were scared to death. My friends, they were still sad and very confused. Jesus was dead. His body was gone from the tomb. Mary Magdalene had come running to them and told them, I have seen the Lord, but could it be? Could it be that he could have been raised up in three days? Well, yes, it was. And I'll give you the scripture reference for that. John 2, 19 through 22. John 2, 19 through 22, Reverend Gerda, we know that Jesus said this indeed would happen. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. What? They exclaimed. It took 46 years to build this temple, and you can do it in three days? But by this temple, Jesus meant his body. And after he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed both Jesus and the scriptures. My friends, the disciples were afraid, they were sad, and they were confused. And I put myself in their position. They probably hadn't had much sleep, so they were tired out and worn out, and that leads to being stressed out. So it's no wonder that Jesus entered through the open doors of their heart to come and appear to them and say, Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Again, what a beautiful, beautiful description, Jesus entering through those open doors. I'm going to repeat to you some of the last words that I spoke in that passage. Write this down, John 20, 29. John 20, 29, Jesus said, blessed are those who haven't seen me and believe anyway. Remember, he had told Thomas, well, you believe, Thomas, because I'm here in the flesh, but blessed are those who believe and haven't seen me. You know who that is? That's you. Amen. And that's me. We choose to believe, and we have not seen him. And he says, those people, you and I, will be blessed. We will be blessed. One of the best blessings, again, this takes us to our teaching title, one of the best blessings for you because you believe, for me because I believe, is that there are only open doors. There are only open doors for us to enter in and go through as we walk the walk with Jesus. But sometimes, my friends, sometimes, even though we understand this truth, and maybe this is a really new truth to you, that there are no closed doors, there are only open doors. Maybe that's a really new truth to you. Maybe it's not, I don't know. But even when we understand that, that there are only open doors, sometimes we still get very confused and unsure about which open door to go through, or maybe even how to get to the open door. We've not even arrived at that open door. So again, I'm going to head down that pathway. It feels like there are multiple open doors to choose from and we really don't know which way to go. Have you felt like that? Sure you have. I have too. I have too. Scripture tells us that Jesus is always the way to go and he always goes before us and prepares the way. Write this down, John 14, 1 through 7. John 14, 1 through 7, Jesus says this is before he was on the cross. He was preparing them that they would go away. He said, don't be troubled. You trust God, now trust in me. There are many rooms in my father's home, and I am going to prepare a place for you. If this were not so, I would not, I would tell you plainly. When everything is ready, when everything is ready, I will, not I might, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Amen. And you know where I'm going and how to get there. No, we don't know, Lord. Thomas said. Again, Thomas was the doubter, and he's the one who says this. No, we don't know, Lord. We haven't any idea of where you are going or how we can know the way. Jesus then said, I am the way, the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one can come to the Father except through me. That scripture tells us that you've got to know Jesus in your heart to get to God in heaven. This side of heaven, and once you die, you've got to know Jesus to talk to God. This side of heaven and be in communion with him, and you've got to know Jesus to get to God once you die. There is no other way. No one can come to the Father except through me, Jesus says. 
If you had known who I am, then you would know who my father is from now on. From now on, you know him and you have seen him. Later on in that same chapter, write this down, John 14, 16 through 17, Jesus said, I will ask the Father. Again, he had just told them he was going away. Now he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who will lead you into all truth. Amen. Basically, he was saying he will show you which way to go. The Holy Spirit, the counselor that Jesus was asking God the Father to send them that you received. When you received Jesus into your heart, you got the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is that guide that Jesus says he will show you which way to go. You will know the truth, remember, and the truth will set you free. And he will never leave you. So when you don't know the way, when you don't know the way, Jesus is the way. Write that down. When I don't know the way, Jesus is the way. When I don't know the way, Jesus is the way. And when you feel confused, the Holy Spirit, my friends, will work in your heart and in your spirit, and the Holy Spirit will make the pathway that God wants you to take abundantly, abundantly clear. I want to share with you a personal story that proves my point. It was shortly after I was saved, and I knew that there were only open doors for me. I pretty much got that concept. I don't know if it was that fall or the following fall. It doesn't matter. But I wanted to go to the Joyce Meyer Women's Conference. And I wanted to go by myself. That's not unusual. I wanted to have quiet time with God. I'm very comfortable traveling by myself. I don't mind driving in big cities. In fact, I kind of love it. That was before the day of GPS or OnStar. So I printed out my directions. And again, I was in St. Louis. And that's about a four-hour drive. Didn't bother me. Well, I was getting into St. Louis, and it was early rush hour traffic, and I drive fast anyway, and I had my directions, but all of a sudden, I'm not kidding you, I'm not kidding you when I say that I experienced a panic attack from the devil, and my hands gripped that wheel, and I started sweating profusely, and I heard that little devil sitting on my shoulder saying, Ramona, you're lost, you're lost, you're not going to get to that conference, you might as well just turn around and go home. And that's exactly what I heard. Well, I'm not kidding. It was bad. And that's unlike me. I don't, I don't panic. So it was real. It was real. And I felt totally lost. And again, you didn't have a GPS then. So I'm driving fast, and cars are just whizzing by me. Now, I'm going to back up and tell you that before I went to this conference, I was in a season in my life when I was praying a prayer that pretty much was the same routine prayer. I would say, God, I just want to see your will for my life. I just want to see your will. Whatever it takes, God, whatever it takes, even if it means putting up a billboard, I just want to see your will. Now, I have no idea, still can't tell you why I said put up a billboard, because this girl has lived in the same little tiny one-horse town, 1,600 people her whole life. We don't have a billboard. We don't have a billboard. So why I said that, I don't know, but that was my prayer. Even if it means putting up a billboard, I just want to see your will. And that was what I prayed for months. Well, now I'm down in St. Louis, and I've got this panic attack going on, and I'm driving fast, and again, my hands are gripping that wheel, and I'm sweating. And I took my eyes off the road for one split second, and I looked up. And there, right there, as I drove fast, really by it, right there was a billboard, a big green billboard with big white letters with one word, Jesus. And I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, Ramona, you've always told me to put up a billboard. Mm -hmm. Now here it is. You are not lost. You're going to get to that conference. There are only open doors for you, and you are on my right pathway. Jesus on a billboard. I got to my hotel and called my mom. My mom and dad live about an hour from St. Louis, and I really, this is not out of the ordinary. I asked my mom to do the impossible. You know, when you think your parents can do the impossible, I've asked them to do the impossible a lot in my life. And I explained my story to mom, and I said, Mom, I don't know how you're going to do it, but you've got to find out who's behind that billboard because I've got to tell them my story, and I've got to thank them for putting up that Jesus billboard. And I told her there's no church name. And there's no 1-800 number for prayer. So, Mom, I don't know how you're going to do it, but you've got to find the person who's responsible for that Jesus billboard because I've got to tell it my story. Well, she called me later that day, and she said, Moni, she said, I really think that I found the man who's in charge of that billboard. His name is Brian Brand, and here's his phone number. 
Well, I've never been shy, and I picked up the phone to call a complete stranger. And I said, Brian Brand, are you the man in charge of those Jesus billboards in St. Louis? And he said, I am. And I told him my story, and he was quite moved and could hear the excitement and the enthusiasm in my voice. And he then invited me to come back to St. Louis and meet with he and his lovely wife, Vicki. And at that time, he said, Ramona, we really don't have anybody up in Iowa to do the Jesus billboards. Would you like to do that? And I said, yes, I would. So for the past several years, um, close to 10, I'm sure now, I've coordinated the, the Jesus Billboard Project in Iowa. And again, it, it's a wonderful thing when I drive by those Jesus Billboards and it takes me back to a time, Jesus. And there are only, only, only open doors. Well, Jesus is your way, my friends. Jesus is your way. And there are only open doors for you. And he will lead you and guide you on which open door to take. Again, I didn't know what was happening or how to get there, but God, God, God used that billboard to show me. There are no closed doors for you, my friends, standing in the way of you fulfilling God's plan. There are only open doors, and you've just got to ask God to take you to that open door and then to give you the grace and the courage and the strength to go through that and enter through it. Again, when you do that, when you do that, when you know that there's only open doors and when you go through those, Reverend Gerda, you have peace of mind and heart because you know you've done it God's right way. You know that it's been through God's leading you through those open doors. You know that you are on the right pathway. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and you're on it. So there is peace that passes all understanding. I want to leave you with a story about a young man who came through our open doors of our church just two weeks ago. This young man is engaged to a young girl in our church, and um, that young girl and her family have been through some hard times. And so they have kind of fallen away from coming to church. Well, I was thrilled when the young girl and her fiancé started coming, and they asked me to officiate their wedding, which I was thrilled and will do later this summer. Well, two Sundays ago, the young man came without the young woman. And Reverend Gerd, I thought, man, that impressed me, because again, it's her church and not his his church, although it is his church, but you know how people think, well, it's her church, and this young man came by himself. And it was two weeks ago when I delivered a message that you heard a couple weeks ago about uh, be firm in your faith. And after everyone left and I had greeted everyone after the service, this young man remained in the pew where he was seated. And I could see that his shoulders were shaking and he was crying. And so I went up beside him and knelt down and put my hand on his knee. And he's a big guy. He's a big guy. And I said, what's going on? And he said, Ramona, he said, you won't believe it. He said, but I so needed to be here today. He said, everything you said in your message was God speaking to me. And every scripture that you read was a scripture that I needed to hear. He said, look at all the notes I've taken. And he gave me that bulletin, and it was covered. And for a young man, that really impressed me. He said, my brother is facing a prison sentence, and I'm really scared. I said, I understand that. I said, does your brother know Jesus? And he said, yes. I said, well then, buddy, God is going to take your brother through that prison sentence, and there will be blessings that come out of it. And Reverend Gerd, I told this young man about Paul being in prison and how nothing could keep him down. There was no closed, locked door in that prison cell that could keep Paul and Silas from singing those hymns. And then remember that story, an earthquake came, an earthquake came as they were praising God and singing those hymns. This is in Acts 16, if you want to write it down, Acts 16, 16 through 40. Acts 16, 16 through 40, Paul and Silas are in that prison cell and an earthquake hit, and again, suddenly those doors, that locked door was open. So I told this young man that it's going to be the same thing for his brother, if he does have to go to prison, there's going to be no locked door that can keep him from God's love. So I asked this young man, I said, buddy, I said, um, I'm really glad that you're here. Did, were you blessed by today? And he said, oh, Ramona, he said, I broke down five times during the message. He said, I'm really sorry. I said, no, don't be sorry. I said, this is the safest place to break down. I said, you're going to leave these open doors. When you walk out of this church through that open door, you're going to leave with peace in your heart that you didn't have when you came in those open doors. And again, that's what I want you to know today, that there are open doors for you, open doors for your brother. He's going to be taken through that prison time, 
and you're going to have peace in your heart as you know that he's not alone and you're not alone. Only open doors for that young man. Only open doors for you. Stay with me. I'll be right back with another really important nugget. Don't go away. Thank you so very much for staying with me. Do you know what a great joy and honor and privilege it is for me to come into your home? More importantly, to come into your heart week after week? Well, let me tell you that I would like to continue to be a blessing to you not only on a weekly basis, but on a daily basis. And we have something just for you. For any financial gift to our ministry, a nonprofit ministry, my friends, we will send you a copy of my book. It's a 60-day daily devotional, my friends, and it was written from my heart to yours to be a blessing to you in your daily journey with Jesus. There's a prayer of salvation in the back that you can use as a tool to lead someone to the Lord. And there's a beautiful poem written by my father that will help you, encourage you, and inspire you to walk the walk with Jesus every day. Will you prayerfully consider making any financial donation to our nonprofit ministry today? When you do, we will send you a copy of my book. Walk the walk with Jesus and be blessed today. My friends, thank you so very much for staying with me. We just really got confirmation that this message is for you. Reverend Gerda Kuhn is one of our studio audience members, and she's the pastor of the Dubuque Church of God. And she said, Ramona, I just delivered a message very similar to this last Sunday. Um, again, this is a powerful message that God obviously needs all of us to hear. There are no closed doors, my friends. There are only open doors. God has prepared your way. He wants you to enter in and go through those open doors as you walk the walk with Jesus. I will see you next week. And again, I want you to be blessed as you go through every open door. Our studio audience is being fed today by Mario's Italian Restaurant. A big shout out for Mario and his staff. Do yourself a favor and walk into Mario's today or tonight. They're located at 1298 Main Street right here in Dubuque, Iowa. Thanks for tuning in today. We hope this message has been a blessing. You can order your DVD of today's message for a cost of only $10. Send your request to Ramona Wick Ministries, care of KFXB TV, 744 Main Street, Dubuque, Iowa, 52001. Or call KFXB at 563-690-1704. If you are interested in Walk the Walk merchandise, you can visit us on the web at winkforjesus.com.